Start recording. So the rate they use here is 47, is that for industrial? <coughs> you said 42 for uh, residential. Yeah, 42 cents. Yeah, it is 47 cents. Really? Yeah. Well, it says in the paper. Interesting. I'll just stand guard for a couple more minutes, but I'm in. Sure. Can we, can we unlock that door? So, Gerald, can you hear what's uh, the conversation in this room? I can hear your half of it. The other half I don't hear very well. Okay. You're loud and clear, but the other's not. There's no way to hear <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, sorry. We, uh, we'll just have to ask people to speak up when they have a question. Or, they can, or we can turn on one of these mics over here and they can talk into it. One of the ones down here? Any, any of them, yes. Yeah. Can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot better. So, Gerald, we're at seven o'clock. Did you want to start now? Do you want to wait a few minutes, or what's? what's are, your you're going to chair this meeting, are you, Tom? I wasn't planning to. Uh, I thought that was your job. Uh, we will certainly provide technical background and all the rest, of it, but I think we want to explain how we got to where we are today, and then go from there. All right. So do you want to lead off then, Tom, and we'll sure. start with the, the history of this? Okay, yeah. So um, first of all, I guess some introductions. Uh, on the screen, you see Gerald Wally. He is the elected representative for your area. My name is uh, Tom Yates. I'm the corporate officer for the regional district. Standing or looming in the doorway is Sean Koopman. He's our protective services coordinator. And now I'm served for tonight. <laughs> And we've got Rivers here hiding in the shadows. He's our IT guy to help us set up this room for the for the meeting. Uh. <laughs> so we've invited the uh, property owners from the from the Duncan Bay Road area because we wanted to talk about an initiative that has come to the regional district from the city of Campbell River, who has uh, advised us that they've over the years had interest from residents in the area about having a fire protection service. So uh, the board, the regional board uh, dealt with that request and said, go forth and investigate this and see what it looks like. And that's the process we're currently in. So we've gone through, we've crunched the numbers based on what the city has said they would provide service for. And I think it's about $10,000 a year thereabouts. And we've looked at that and met with uh, some residents from that area who said, um, there's probably some interest in this. We should take it to the people and see what they want to do with this. So that's kind of where we're at. We have um, we have a lot of information around that. And maybe Sean, if you want to kind of pick up the thread and talk about some of the details around the city's uh, proposal, what it includes, what it doesn't include, um, and then we can start with questions and costs. Uh, yeah, so the city's proposal is the exact same services that the folks in the city of Campbell River would include. So they're technical. Sean, Sean would you mind speaking to the mic? Kind of. So all, all the services that are available to city residents would be available to this proposed service area as well. So road rescue, technical rope rescue, the city has a fire smart coordinator that you can book to come to your property and do a wildfire risk reduction assessment, including fire suppression. 
So correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but uh, would that would not also include like a first responder? Right. First responder is basically a paramedic response. So that's what the city has offered, and the price is about ten thousand dollars a year, as I mentioned. Yeah, about ten thousand eight hundred a year. So the cost of doing the cost of uh, to the ratepayers for that area, <clears throat> and we've calculated that at about um, forty-two cents per thousand of assessment. If you're residential, residential or farm would pay that rate. There are some businesses and light industry in the area. They would pay more uh, business at a dollar three light industry at a dollar forty three again uh, based on assessed values of property. And uh, we've calculated what that would mean for different values of property and all that's in this information sheet here. Um, and what we would do if the residents in the area are supportive of this, we would then pass a bylaw to set up the service. And there would be uh, need to be a contract signed with the city of Campbell River, probably for a five year term, uh, which would uh, <clears throat> which would uh, commit the city to provide that service, just as they provide that to any other area of the city. Um, yeah, so. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, you say probably at a five year term. Yeah. What would happen after that hypothetical five year term was over? Well, if both parties were satisfied with the service, then I think we'd probably renew it. The, the rate might go from 10,000 to 11,000. I don't know, but that would be something to look at at the time. And of course, if we had to, any bylaw that we put in place for a service like this, will have to have a cap or a ceiling on the requisition that we can raise in a given year. So if the city was asking for more than what the what that limit was, we'd have to go back to the people to the public and see if they were willing to pay that extra amount, whatever it was. So if I might ask Tom, what would the term of the contract likely be? Uh, probably five years. At a set rate for five years? Yes. Well, probably there probably be an inflation factor in that. We don't right. know because we haven't started those conversations with the city. They've given us a price for now. And of course, they, are, they understand that for us to commit to a contract, uh, we have to have, we have to stay within our bylaw limit. They understand that. Right. Now, this would eventually go to referendum, would it, Tom? Uh, well, it depends. This, it, this right now that we're going through is called a petition process. It's a legal process. If we have a majority of the property owners indicate they're in favor of the proposal, then the board could proceed to adopt the bylaw. If a majority of residents either don't respond or indicate that they don't, don't support it, then the decision would have to be made by the board whether to continue down this road or not. I understand. So I wonder if we have uh, any questions from the uh, residents that are present. Yeah, if, um, if uh, the 50 percent agree, does that mean the other 50 percent has to pay up? Yeah, good question. So the question is, <clears throat> If 50% of the properties agree to this proposal, does that bind the other 49%, whatever, uh, to, to this? And yes, it would. So this is called a collective decision-making process. So it's a majority of the properties that would basically decide whether or not they wish to have this for their community. Well, that means 100% gets covered. Yes, it's 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 either go, it's either go or no go for the whole thing. Yes. And so the next step in this then is surveying the residents, um, and how would that be done by mail out? Right. Basically? So the question is, how would residents be surveyed? So we have produced a, a petition form for each property. 
and you see them lined up on the shelves here. And so each property will have to decide whether or not it supports the proposal. And we will, um, at the end of a month and a half or two months, whatever, <clears throat> uh, depending on the results of that to come back, we will need at least 50% of the properties to say, yes, we're in favor in order to move forward. And if we don't have that, then we can't move forward on it. And what's the total number of properties in the area? Um, total number of properties, I believe, is about 55 or thereabouts. Okay, does Blue Spruce Home Park count as one property? No, it's uh, there's or like each individual. Each property, each uh, mobile home within within the mobile home park has uh, the ability to either uh, support or not support. And they would be counted like any other property. And so then if you didn't have enough of a response, you didn't get a, what would be your criteria for deciding, you know, how would the board decide whether to go ahead with it? Well, so the question is, if, if, the, if there isn't support obvious through the petition process, what is the next step? I would say that depends. And Gerald, you could correct me if I'm wrong here, but if we get 98% of the properties coming back through petitions saying we do not support this, I think that tells us there really is not a whole lot of interest in that area. If on the other hand, it comes back at 49.5% in favor and the rest never respond, that's going to be a question for the political body to sort out and figure, is there enough support to take this through another channel to, you know, tr to try and uh, see if the service can be brought into being? Um, so that's a difficult question to answer, and there's, there's a lot of nuance to that. Yeah, if I might add, Tom, the overall principle is that we want public support before we move ahead on this. If the public doesn't support it, we won't uh, put it in against the public's will. Exactly. Yes. Nor can we do that. If the public does not want this, there's no way on earth we can force the public to take this. Nor would we want to. Right. Why, why would we want that? So, yeah. So the best way that you can help. Mike, Sean. <laughs> so for those in attendance, one of the best ways you can help is to just be the community pokers. So please remind your neighbors that they are to respond to this. Don't try and influence their vote, please. But the more the more responses we get back, the better we can indicate the level of support. So could I ask if anyone here tonight is from the Blue Spruce? Oh, you are. OK. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if your neighbors are even aware of this process. We uh, unfortunately didn't know about their individual holdings until probably we'd been into this for a few months. So they kind of missed out on, on the first few discussions that were held. Um, but since then, we've tried to include them as best we can in the, uh, in the process. And just to talk about the process, there were, uh, Sean, how many local property owners uh, did we engage with as a group, kind of like the steering committee, basically, to look at different options for how the tax would be levied, uh, what would the city require in terms of water supply? Uh, what is the uh, response time for fire, fire equipment to show up in the area? That kind of thing. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I was waiting for a point to jump in and especially thank Laura and Ken from this area who served on the steering committee. We started the steering committee with the Duncan Bay and Race Point Road areas and electoral area today to, together as the same steering committee had a couple meetings with the fire chief, assessed their proposal, gauge community feedback, and went back to the board. Just the two communities are so different. One has hydrants, one doesn't. One has a longer response time, one doesn't. One will likely benefit from insurance saving, one likely won't. Um, so we uh, the recommendation from that committee was, let's treat this as two separate areas. You know, the votes in Race Point shouldn't tie Duncan Bay to anything. The votes in Duncan Bay vice versa so yeah no thanks laura and ken for your time on this one actually we haven't done a survey no we we met we, we met with a few of the residents sean just mentioned and um 
what we were advised was there was enough interest to at least push this forward to this point. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're at. So this process that we call a petition process is really the survey of the community, of the property owners in the community. And it is a formal process, so it's not like uh, a telephone survey or something like that. If people are interested enough to commit to this uh, initiative, then they can sign the petition sheet and that commits them as being either a supporter or an opposer of the of the initiative. And, and that will guide us in the future. If, uh, if we don't get enough support, then as far as I'm concerned, we move on to other projects. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. We, we're, not going, we're not going to move forward on this without support from the community. I have one question, Tom. In the interim, while the petitions are uh, being filled out, who would be the contact person for residents if they have further questions? Would that be Sean? Uh, Sean or myself, and, and you know, we'll field all the questions depending on what they are. It'll either be Sean that responds or, or myself. Um, the petition process, uh, we've included with each package a, a set of guidelines for how to fill out the petition. And uh, But still, there could always be questions that are not addressed in that, and we would be happy to do that if people have questions. Thank you. When will these petitions be mailed out? So the question is, when will the petitions be mailed out? Uh, we were planning, I think, to mail them tomorrow for those who didn't show up tonight, so. You saved us $8 in postal fees, thank you. <laughs> so I know that it did get brought up, and I just want, maybe we need the mic on for me. I'm not sure. You might want to paraphrase this, but I don't know how. I might be terribly wordy. Um, the, I think everyone can hear me, right? Gerald, you can hear me? Not very well. If you could use the microphone, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, during when I was speaking to some of the community members, it did get brought up that the Blue Spruce trailer park was concerned with um, possibly an insurance for the owner of the Blue Spruce trailer park, um, if that insurance was going to be like skyrocket because of something, or if the fees for the owner of the Blue Spruce trailer park was going to skyrocket because of this. I, yeah, could you just speak on that and yeah, maybe I'll, just comment and... Well, I'll try. Yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, so, so as far as insurance goes, I would think their insurance costs would drop if they're insuring uh, buildings on their property. Um, but again, that would be up between them and their insurance agent or broker. As we recommend for all property owners, check with your insurance agent to find out what uh, cost savings you might see from having this in place. Uh, as far as costs for having the service, um, the Blue Spruce Mobile Home Park owners would be charged for whatever taxable property they they own. Um, so, and, and by that I mean, all of the property that is occupied by mobile homes would be assessed to those mobile home owners, not to the mobile home park itself. Now, the mobile home park probably owns the land on which those mobile homes sit. So, and I don't know what the assessed value of that is, but they should, uh, they sh and we do have in this report um, an assessment of what that would look like for various values, and they should probably have a look at that. It's all online. They can look at that, and they will have to decide based on that whether they support this initiative or not. And... Um, Certainly, if they have questions, happy to answer them. But I mean, that's the way taxation works. Um, it's based on the value of, of the property that's uh, assessed by the province. Um, insurance costs are all over the place. I really urge people to check with their insurance agent. Uh, some, some insurance companies will offer 60, 65% savings. 
others may offer less than that. And so we don't really want to tell people exactly how much they might save. That's really for them to check into. So just just so I'm clear on this, then the owner of the mobile home trailer park would have one vote for their petition, and then all of the owners of each individual unit would also have a vote. Essentially, yes, yes, but it would be for each property that they own. So if the mobile home park owners own more than one property, they would have more than one vote. But the but, it, but for the mobile home park itself, it's probably it's probably assessed as one property, all of that land. So in that in that scenario, they would have basically one petition to fill out. Either they're for it or against it. Sean, you can uh, Ken, Ken Fear here. I can speak to that a little bit. Please, please go ahead. So I own 5400 Duncan Bay Road, which is industrial. So my taxes will go up quite a bit on that property. Basically because it's 1.43% times the uh, 992,000 um, basically appraised value. So definitely my taxes would go up a set or a, a quite a bit on the industrial not so much on the residential. Right. Right, because industrial has to be, um, taxes have to be quite a bit higher than residential. And that's not a regional district choice. That's the way the province's tax system works in the rural areas. So. Yeah, I'm just realizing that now looking at the numbers. So. Right. No, you're correct. So that that is the way the system works. Um, I'm not here to defend the system. It is what it is. Um, so you, you'll get to decide whether you're in favor or not of this proposal. So my taxes last year would have been, well, it actually doesn't tell me on here, but they would go up to 14,000. Yeah, I'm looking right now at the report. And did you say $900,000 was the value? 922 this year. 922,000. So, and that's classed as industry or business? Industrial. Industrial. So, $900,000, uh, we're projecting about $1,287 uh, $1 per year for the service for that value of industrial property. Yes. 1200 I thought it'd be. Closer to. Right, are you sure on that? I'm just looking at the chart in the um, in the report that was done. So a value yeah. of nine hundred thousand dollars for light industrial property. Uh, we're showing twelve hundred and eighty seven dollars and change. Um, and that is based on a tax rate. Annual tax rate of uh, a dollar 43 per thousand. Industrial property is charged quite a higher rate than residential. So what does that work out to for the year? Well, like I say, we've we've projected that to be twelve hundred and eighty seven dollars and twenty seven cents per year. That's on nine hundred thousand dollars. Years is probably say nine hundred and twenty odd thousand. So it'd be a little bit more than that. I maybe don't have enough decimal points in. <laughs> maybe. But again, you know, I would I would urge anyone to uh, to check with their insurance company to see if the reduction in their insurance premiums would cover the cost of taxation for this. Because typically there is quite a saving. I don't know about industrial property, but certainly for residential, there is a considerable saving if you have uh, fire protection available to you. Yes. Tom, can you comment that multiple, if one property has multiple owners, they're each going to be receiving their own petition form? 
can you just unpack that a little bit? Sure. So <clears throat> with the petition process, uh, where a property has multiple owners, then a majority of those owners must agree uh, before we can count that as being in favor. So if there's three owners of a property, then at least two of them, being a majority, would have to sign the petition saying they're in favor, um, or all three of them could. If a uh, property is owned by two individuals, typically husband and wife, then a majority of them will be both. Like one is not going to be a majority, so both of them would have to indicate that they're in favor before we could count that property as uh, supporting the proposal. I that last week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to everybody, but that's the law, so. May I just ask, so what would happen now if, say, there was a residential fire in that area? What would the response I'm be? Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? So at the moment, without the city fire protection, right. what happens if there's a residential fire up in that area? So the question is, what happens if there's a fire right now before there's any kind of service being put in place? My understanding from talking to the city is that they will not leave their boundaries to uh, deal with a fire response. Okay. That's what they tell us. And what they've done is they've, uh, they've said basically that they, they risk too much liability by doing that when they leave their boundaries that um, it puts residents of, of Campbell River at a greater risk and their insurance will not cover them when they do that. In other words, their insurance as a city is based on them confining their activities to within city limits. So there would be no fire response at all? That's what we are being told, yes. That's terrifying. Well, it is what it is, <laughs> you know. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I just, I, I have, uh, my niece lost her home to fire in Santa Rosa a few years ago and oh. had five minutes to get out of her house and yeah. it burned to the ground and as did all of the city. Um, that scares me not having any fire response at all. Well, I can tell you, I've been involved with, with quite a large number of communities uh, wanting to get fire protection. And um, in many cases, communities have rejected the idea. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as there's a major fire, they're clamoring for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just human nature, right? So um, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here, right. but. But that has historically been uh, not unusual to see that. Now, if it was a wildfire, we'd get a wildfire response. But a residential fire, no fire response. Yeah, correct. So if the fire spread to the city's jurisdiction, the city will respond there. If the fire spread to Crown Forest Lands, BC wildfire would respond there. But they wouldn't save your homes. No, no the uh, BC Forest Service is not interested in saving homes. They're interested in saving the... Uh, forest the uh, forest resources, the trees, basically. So you, you went, you went in, in, in the interim for this court too. You still don't have any fire protection. So the question is, um, we don't have any fire protection now, and until this is all done and done, we still wouldn't have fire protection. Is that the question? Yeah. So yeah, I think so. Now, According to our research, it would take a while yet. Let's assume that the petition process uh, goes through. Uh, end of February, we've got enough responses to say to the board, yes, the residents support it. The board then adopts the bylaw, presumably. Then and only then are we going to enter into a contract with the city of Campbell River. Um, unfortunately, we can't give them any money right away because uh, we're too late for, to raise taxes this year. So we would have to talk to them about what kinds of service could they possibly provide in 2023, uh, pending our ability to raise money through the tax base. And I don't know what the response would be at this point, but I think the fire department would be keen to have the service in place. One of the reasons they have put this forward, I believe, is they're saying that it, um, it is very difficult for their dispatchers to know whether or not to send a fire truck to a fire uh, when the boundary for the city cuts in and out of different roads up in that area. Like there's no clear 
definitive boundary that uh, the dispatcher can necessarily provide to them. So because half of the road is one side of the road is in the city and the other side is not. So it creates confusion at the dispatch center. So they, I think they are quite keen and quite interested in, in doing this. But again, um, what their attitude will be before we can give the money, I don't know. We'd have to look at that. It's a good question. And did I, I, I think I saw something in here that the donations could also be Yes, the regional district will always accept donations. We rarely get them, but uh, th there's there's nothing to stop us uh, taking donations for services. And, and issuing tax receipts for those donations, by the way. Just so we're clear. You'll find that same statement in every single... Sean, could you turn on your mic, please, and just leave it on? You'll find that same statement in every feasibility study because we just want to inform the public this is all the different ways it could happen. I mean, if we found the money on, lying on the street and it was marked for the uh, for the uh, Duncan Bay Road Fire Initiative, that's where it would go. So yes, it would take a while for this thing to be put in place. And I think we put together a calendar based on the assumption that people support it. Uh, we're basically looking at uh, do, 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 probably sometime in May or June, actually sitting down with the city of Campbell River. Uh, if people support this initiative and ironing out a contract, which is not going to be that difficult, but there will be the one point that you raise about um, when can we pay them for the service they're going to offer. And, and I think I think we can make some headway on that. So may I ask you a question since you reside in the mobile home uh, park? Yes. Uh, are, are many of your neighbors even aware of this proposal or are they kind of, uh, I know nothing about that or? I honestly don't know if this was happening, I think in summertime and we were all out on the streets chatting with right. each other, it would be a different story. But because this has happened in the fall and we're all sort of sheltering out of the rain and snow. Right. I I don't know, but I'll definitely be poking. So may I ask, how did you find out about uh, tonight's meeting? Was it through the... Um, uh, through the mail, because okay. I filled out... Well, I we got the, um, the note about the steering committee. Yeah. I was going to be out of town. For yeah, that, that was back in July. Yes. Yeah. So I wasn't able to do that, but I've been monitoring this because... I really do want fire protection up there. Um, okay, well, that's see good. What was going on. And, and, so, if, and if you want to go door to door with a feasibility study for everyone, I will print you off 30 copies and bring them by. I might take you up on that. So, as I mentioned, we have prepared uh, packages for each property owner. And um, where there are multiple owners of a property, we've created a package for each of those people. So we will be mailing those out to anyone who is not here tonight. And uh, hopefully they don't go, don't go straight in the garbage. Hopefully people will look at them and think about it and decide whether or not they're in favor and mail it back. And that would really be appreciated by us. Leave your mic on, Sean. So please poke and remind your neighbors just vote. Yes, um, I I think actually this would be the feasibility study. I'd be happy to go around the park and drop these off. Good. It's a short walk. <laughs> nice <laughs> exercise. Yes. You want to just wait five minutes, and I'll go up here and put this in right now. Okay, I will. So here's a separate question. Yes. Assuming we get fire protection, and I don't have city water, would it, would it make it easier for me to get city water? Um, the fire department is telling us uh, no. Um, and by that I mean just because there is fire protection does not mean that city water will follow along with it. 
Um, what they're saying is they, as a fire department, they have access to hydrants. They have also access to other water sources. They have a tanker service that travels with the pumper truck. And uh, so the area that we're looking at would be fully protected for insurance purposes uh, and within, within their uh, response limits. I, I don't know exactly how many miles. I think it's less than five miles to the fire hall, something like that. So uh, they are not saying that uh, city water comes with this proposal. It's just fire trucks. Fire trucks and firefighters would show up with water and put out fires or deal with heart attacks or whatever other paramedic uh, type things they do. Yes, please. Just push the big button and leave it on, please. There we go. So when we met with the fire chief back in the summer, he had said that there's like, there's not even that, all those fire hydrants that are up by our house, they're not even in use right now. They're like roughed in or going to be used maybe possibly at a later time, but that's not even where they would be getting water from. So mm -hmm. not at this oh, time. They're all very no. They'd be probably going to test them and it's locked. They're right across the street. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But that's no problem. You mm -hmm. mean they're not active? Mm -hmm. well, no. That can't be right. <laughs> Well, I wish I had someone from the fire department to respond to that question. I know, because I know. Having fire hydrants uh, set on the roadside and not in use yeah. is kind of a weird thing. But. So he had said that they were put in and maybe us, now this is just like, he was just talking. I don't know if like this is, it wasn't getting written down or anything, but he had said that they were going to possibly us getting fire protection might allow them to be able to use them because right now he just said like well we'll just wait for a later time tba kind of kind of uh statement that he had said to us when we met with him so if i understand correctly what you're saying is that if if there was if this initiative goes through then they might actually connect those hydrants to the water system is that kind of what he in, in implied? Yes, it was. It was like a that was that was a thought right. that came out. Yes. Right. Okay. Interesting. I oh, found that amazing that they're just sitting there for a show doing something. I thought they were all very energized. And put them on the main part of the water line, probably because it was underneath and it was connected. When I first bought, which was six or seven years ago, I spoke with my insurance agent when we were trying to find like affordable insurance. And the person that I was speaking to had said, that's not like, it's not here or there because you're not getting fire protection. We're still going to charge you ridiculous amounts for fire or for insurance because we don't care that your house is right beside a fire hydrant because they're not even using those. So, yeah, it doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> so, so for those who may not be aware of it, when insurance companies provide a risk rating for properties, they usually ask questions like how many miles uh, to the fire department, to responding fire department, and how close are is your property to the nearest fire hydrant? And if your property is close to a fire hydrant and is served by a fire department, you will get a lower insurance rate than if you're just serviced by a fire department. Four kilometers. It's really four kilometers. Sorry, how long? How Twelve. far? Twelve. Twelve kilometers? Yeah, and you're okay. Yeah, and I've seen insurance companies that will go as high as 13 and a half kilometers. You got to realize it's it's a competitive business. They're trying for uh, more customers, so they do compete with each other for on a service level. Um, some will go less than 12 kilometers. Some go 13, 13 and a half. So that's why we encourage people to check with their insurance company to see how much the saving would be for their particular property. But it wouldn't, uh, either way, it wouldn't matter because the outside city limit, even if you are 
even have asphalt problems, but I'm on the other side of the city. Well, the insurance companies don't care. All they care about is what is the risk that we are taking on by taking this customer and insuring this customer. And as long as there is a responding fire department, whether you're inside city limits or not, and don't get me wrong, there's many, many communities in BC that do not have their own fire department. They're serviced by a neighboring community. So they don't really look at those issues. They look at how far is the nearest responding fire department from your house? And are you located near a hydrant? Those are the questions they typically yeah, ask. They ask you how many meters you have from the hydrant. Mm -hmm. so, yes, and that's right. It's not even worth yeah, they said they don't care. <laughs> oh, yeah. but if we get fire protection, then yeah, I mean, then we're going to get considerably cheaper insurance, right? Yeah. So then they they all, all of a sudden be very. Oh, you have fire protection now. That's good. Well, in my experience, typically your 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 standard insurance company will offer between fifty and sixty percent uh, insurance reduction uh, based on having fire protection versus not having it. Again, that's you know that's a, a, a rough number. Some will be more, some will be less. So you really need to check with your insurance company if you if you need to know that number. It is unfortunate that fire protection is viewed um, typically by people through their pocketbook, but that, that is the reality, that's human nature. Um, and until there's a terrible fire and people get burned up and all the rest of it, most communities are, they're just gonna look at it from that perspective. That's the only thing that matters. Um, everything will change if there's a bad fire. No, say that much. You get fire protection, I imagine it will increase the value of the property. It typically will. It certainly, uh, it certainly will attract more people into the market for that property, for sure. So it's always an issue. Yeah. You do have fire protection. Sure. Hey, it's the way the world is, and we're not inventing it. We're just telling you the way it is, and uh, you'll have to decide whether this is for you or not. And like I say, if there's any, and I'm sure there will be more questions from either yourselves or your neighbors, um, we'll try to answer them as best we can. We have all of this information is on our website and people can go on there and look at all of that information and, uh, and get a hold of us if there's any questions they have and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, been some really good questions tonight and you have another one. I have another one. Well, I, have a, I, I want you to comment. I, okay, so... Um, when I was speaking with some of the people that were residents in Duncan Bay, they had mentioned, more than one person had mentioned their concern that if we get fire protection through the city, that this is going to be the stepping stone for them somewhat forcing some of the bigger properties in the area to all of a sudden be taken over by the city of Campbell River. And that would kill most of us because we have really big properties up there. So could you speak on that or maybe let some sure. of those residents well, I'll, relax I'll certainly, a bit? Well, certainly if we're asked a question, we can respond, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that. <clears throat> Number one, um, I'm, of the aver I'm of the opposite opinion on that. Um, first of all, the city can't force anyone to uh, be annexed. They would have to have the permission of those properties to do that. Um, unless the city actually buys it and owns the property, they cannot just incorporate it well. They have to, they have to get the permission of the area they want to incorporate, usually through a referendum process. Uh, secondly, I would say that if the city was to come along after the fact and say, we want to scoop a bunch of properties that we're currently serving under contract, I think the board, our board might have something to say about that because all of a sudden now we've got fewer properties paying the bill for the service. And so, again, in my experience, that has tended to uh, reduce the, shall we say, the predatory nature of some city governments to try and just scoop more properties to get the taxes. And when you think about it, they are going to get something out of this. They're going to get something they didn't have before. Uh, I can't speak to what the mentality of the city council would be to try and 
use this as some kind of a wedge to somehow get the properties annexed. Um, that would be kind of deceitful in my opinion. So, Gerald, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Gerald, I think your mic is off. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just to say that uh, I think you're right that they would have to have consent of the uh, community before they were able to amalgamate that area. Uh, I just add one thing here that uh, it's very important for me that as many residents as possible respond to this petition so that I can have a fair idea of what people really think. It's uh, very difficult for me to try and come to a decision if I don't really know uh, the way people feel about this. So please encourage your neighbors to fill these petitions out. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I will just to reiterate here, if we, if we uh, any petition that is not returned, we will count that in the negative. So if, if it's a poor response, uh, even we might get a 100% uh, uh, approval rate from 20 properties. That is not good enough. So we would need, we would need a large number of properties to respond saying that they support this before we can move forward. And you know, politically, as Gerald has mentioned, if it's a, a tie, a 50-50 tie, then you know that's always harder for someone to say, yeah, the community supports, uh, than if it's like a 70-30 a, a or an 80-20 percentage, so. <clears throat> if I got that right, Gerald? Yes, you do, and I guess if it was me, I would be out lobbying my neighbors just for whatever position I held, but generally the way politics works. Well, the young lady here from the Momo Home Park has said she's going to be knocking on doors, so that's a good thing. At least, at least people will be aware of it. Then they can make up their own minds whether they like it or not, and and then we'll know. Well, that's right. It's hard to complain if you don't participate and it doesn't turn out the way you want it. But it's super easy for people to complain <laughs> and still not get it the way they want it and <laughs> not have to participate. It doesn't cost anything to complain. So people love to do it. Though. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, the regional district, we've got lots of irons in the fire for other areas that are looking at to get it, getting things done. So it, it doesn't bother us. If the community doesn't want this, then fine, just tell us and, and we'll move on. You know, we're not we're not here to fill some kind of agenda or anything like that. Um, we provide services that people want and are prepared to pay for. And that's that's a simple formula. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll find out one way or another. You mentioned uh, under the scenario that if the city annex our property, is that such a law that would allow them to annex our property? Well, I think this young lady over here raised the issue. So your question is, is what exactly? Well, the chances that they might take over our property when they have to join the city. Is there a law that, that the city can annex the property? Well, under, under the law right now, the city cannot annex properties against their will. So they would have to get consent from the property owners in order to do that. So I don't, I don't know the people in your area of the world um, well enough to be able to tell you uh, whether they would find paying city taxes for all that the city provides is, is something that is attractive to them. I don't know one way or another. I, I'm making the assumption that people live in a rural area because they enjoy that rural lifestyle, not because they want uh, all of city, the city services. But whether that's true or not, I don't know. But we managed to get city water uh, to sign an agreement that if the city ever expanded, you would have to join. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. You're saying that. But then, then you have no option, obviously. Because then Chile decided to do Right. So, so what you're saying, I think, is that your neighbor uh, signed an agreement with the city to get city water and. The agreement he signed gave the city some kind of power over annexing him in the future. Yeah, yeah that could be. I don't know. I, I don't really know, but that's a possibility. So I know there's going to be more questions and uh, by all means, uh, we're here to answer those questions if we can. Um, 
we're giving what are, what are we giving Sean we're giving about six weeks for this process correct Feb, uh, February 24th Leave the mic on, please. February 24th okay so that's a close to six weeks I think so um, hopefully we'll we'll hear from the people and uh, after that uh, deadline um, the plan is to take this back to, to our board with the results of the petition and if there's a clear majority that want it uh, and that that's a political decision not a not a staff decision then uh, the board can decide to move ahead on it and otherwise uh, we'll be putting this back on the shelf and thank you very much for your input and uh, we'll move on to something else <laughs> well, sadly enough, judging by the amount of people here, it doesn't look like any interest. <laughs> no, the turnout tonight has been less than I thought. I it's still going up. So, you know, but you never know. You never know. I, if he, if I you people over the holidays, and there were people that were saying that they actually very much want to try and make it to this meeting, and there was interest, so it's going to take this now. In my experience, when people are, are dead set against something, they will definitely show up and speak their opinion. When they're ambivalent or they support something, sometimes you have to, you have to drag them to the to the ballot box. I mean, that's just the way it is. So I don't know what that means in this case. Uh, maybe people just didn't know about it, whatever, but uh, we'll find out soon enough. And really appreciate you taking the time this evening to come out and give us your opinions. And thank you, Gerald. Are there any last words that you wish to offer? Well, I'd just like to thank those people that came out and participated tonight. And uh, any uh, opportunity you have to spread the word would certainly be appreciated. The more people that know about it and can uh, be informed to, to either consent or disagree would, would be excellent. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ken. There could be a lot more people watching on the Zoom that just don't have their voice. I'm sorry, Ken, you're you're pretty faint. Can you repeat that, please? There could be more people on Zoom that are not, not very talkative, too. Yeah, yeah, and if there are others there, then uh, they have been pretty quiet tonight. And maybe we've answered their questions, and that's good. Um, but like I say, if they've got other questions, we're here to uh, to answer them if we can. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Our, our... Bye for Thanks, now. Ken. Bye now.